Hello, my name is Pat Allen, and I uh, help with interviews for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. And uh, it is conducted under the auspices of the Hamilton, uh, the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library. And it is done under the uh, direction uh, of Brian Powers. And Brian uh, happens to be here today, and he's our cameraman. And we have the privilege today, which is April the 17th, of 2019 to uh, meet and interview General William the Priest. Uh, General, thank Hi. you for coming. It's pleased to meet you. Uh, how would you like to be called during this interview? Oh, I'm Bill for sure. Okay, yeah, Bill. General was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's uh, before we get into your military career, let's mm -hmm. let's talk about uh, some of your background. Uh, where and when were you born? I was born on the 24th of May, 1944, outside of Round County, Kentucky, at a little place called Ellettsville. Um, just happened to have born, be born in the same house, same room, same bed as my mother. She was born about 17 years before I was born, <laughs> which should tell you a little something, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, and how long did you live there? I uh, lived there for a grand total of about two months, as best I can, uh, I can gather, uh, and then moved from there uh, to Dayton, Ohio, and was in and around the Dayton, Ohio area, other than my active duty military time uh, since. Uh, what were your mom and dad's uh, names? Uh, dad was William LaPrise Sr. Uh, mother's name was, her maiden name was Naomi Fultz. Um, F-U-L-T-Z, a very, very German, which is pretty typical in that area of Kentucky. Okay, did you, uh, uh, did you have any recollection of when they got, when they got buried? Uh, do you remember that day? Um, I don't, I should know that. Off the top of my head, I can't come up with it. Um, I know that, uh, that that's kind of a long convoluted story about uh, they're getting married. Obviously, they were very, very young and kind of the standing joke in the house was we all grew up together. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what did your dad do as far as uh, making a living for the family? Uh, dad spent virtually his entire career uh, with General Motors um, in the Dayton area. Started off at the old downtown Dayton Frigidaire plant and then ended up uh, in his last couple of years in Moraine. At that time, uh, it was Delco Air. Was he a skilled tradesman? Uh, he was. Um, he spent his virtually all of his career in what he called tool troubleshooting. He did the installation of the big machinery and repair of the big machinery in those plants. And then in about the last four years of his, uh, his General Motors career, he was foreman um, in the tool room. So Dad was a, a young man, never graduated high school, was able to live the great American dream. Um, his entire career at General Motors, which obviously no longer exists in the Dayton area. Right, it's been a, been a few years. Yeah. Uh, and how about your mother? Did she work outside the home, or did she just take um, care of family? Mom was uh, was the traditional housekeeper. Uh, spent her entire time within the home, uh, taking care of what were three children. That's a long story. Uh, I have one living sister now. Her name is Vicky, and she lives in North Bend, not far from here. And uh, the, the one that passed away, was that a brother or sister? Um, that was my sister, Connie, and uh, uh, died in a terrible, horrible uh, tragedy in Beaver Creek, uh, 1959. She and seven other Girl Scouts and the two Girl Scout leaders were killed in a automobile train ca crash right outside of uh, Xenia, Ohio. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, just terrible, in fact, interestingly, uh, just uh, a week ago, I uh, was attending a, a commemoration ceremony, if you will, um, in a park that's been created in Beaver Creek in their, uh, in their memory, in beautiful their, park. Uh, that's very nice, yeah. very nice. So uh, tell me a little bit about your education. Where'd you go to uh, grade school? Grade school was Our Lady of the Rosary, and then Resurrection, and then finally in the sixth grade, moved to Beaver Creek, where I ended up graduating from Beaver Creek High School in uh, 1962. All right, uh, what did you do after graduating from high school? Um, University of Dayton. Um, picked up my bachelor's degree at the University of Dayton. Um, and in the throes of that experience at the University of Dayton, um, uh, I jokingly mentioned that I majored in ROTC. 
uh, because that was where my focus was at that time. My, uh, my intent at that point was to, uh, was to make a career out of the Army. Um, and so uh, graduated in 1966 and then immediately left there for Fort Knox, Kentucky and Armor Officer Basic. All right, before we get into that, uh, are you married? I am married. I've uh, been married for wife? 53 years to Ann Wekeser. Um We're dinosaurs, uh, like say 53 years with the same lady. How did you meet Ann? <laughs> Met her at the University of Dayton. Um, and, and the short version of that story is um, I had been dating somebody else at the time and uh, was working close to where Ann lived. Good friend of mine was dating Ann at the time and uh, she was having a hard time getting to school on time at the University of Dayton. And so my good friend, uh, my ex-good friend, uh, <laughs> <laughs> suggested that I pick her up and take her to, uh, to school, which is what I did. And out of that, I gained a wife and lost a friend. Lost a friend, <laughs> <And> right. <so. laughs> and when did you and Ann get married? Um, that was May 11th, 1966. All right, so was that? I'm sorry, May 14th, you'll never forgive me. And um, you have children? We do. How many children uh, do you have? You have three daughters. Uh, Laura's 51, uh, Krista is 49, and uh, Suzanne is 45. Laura is a physical therapist in Leesburg, Virginia. Uh, Krista is about 300 yards from us and is a middle school uh, intervention specialist at Mimesburg Schools. And Suzanne's in Upper Arlington, um, raising three gorgeous, beautiful children, which we're very, very happy about. And, and the reason why I mention that is um, Suzanne has a, a condition called spinal muscle atrophy. So she's, um, pretty much wheelchair bound and she raised these three children on the floor because she obviously wasn't able to uh, pick up and, and what have you. So pretty proud of that young lady. She, she pulled off a, a stunt that I did not think it was possible. Wow, uh, so that, that's unbelievable. It really uh, is. Now, it really what is. are the kids' last names, um, married names? Uh, Laura um, Fry, F-R-E-Y, Krista Pickering, P-I-C-K-E-R-I-N-G, and Suzanne Ammons, A-M-M-O-N-S. Right. Suzanne's in uh, Upper Arlington. Right. Uh, do the older two have children? Do you have grandchildren? There's a total of eight of, of the grandchildren. Laura, the total of eight, Laura has two, Krista has three, and Suzanne has three. three. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's take a uh, little bit of time with your, your military. After you graduate uh, from UD and you're in ROTC, and when you graduated, uh, how long was it before you enlisted? Um, graduated uh, in April, and uh, my, first assign my first kind of interim assignment was at Fort Indian Town Gap Military Reservation, Anvil, Pennsylvania. And that was in April. I went straight from graduation straight to uh, Indian Town Gap, and that was just a, a filler assignment until such time as the, my armor officer basic class opened. Um, and so that class opened uh, about a month later. And then from that point on, from really from graduation in, in April of 1966 through uh, December of 70, I was active duty military. All right. So four years between Indian Town Gap and uh, yeah, it was about almost 70. it was almost five years total. Right. Um, what rank were you when you went to Indian Town Gap? I was a brand spanking new, no nothing second lieutenant, uh, with uh, with every intention, like I say at that point, of making the Army a career. Well, tell us a little bit about your your training and experience there at Indian Town Gap. Well, at Indian Town Gap, uh, I was there to assist with the conduct of the ROTC summer camp program. So, um, and, and I just, uh, for lack of a better term, just kind of hung out because there wasn't a whole lot going on. But, uh, but uh, so that, that was kind of like a, a one, I think it was a total of about a month that I was there. Right. And then went from there to, uh, to my Armor Officer Basic course at uh, Fort Knox. Uh, so your armor school was at Fort Knox, mm -hmm. and that was in uh, what? 66? Started. Uh, that was in '66. Uh, I think I was out of there. Finished that in October of of 1966, and um, 
from my point of view, we had an absolutely plum assignment. You have to remember the time frame. We're in the throes of the whole Vietnam yeah. era, if you will. Um, and so my assignment uh, was to A Troop, 1st Squadron, 14th Armored Cavalry Regiment in Fulda, Germany. Second Lieutenant as a tank platoon leader. So that, that was your first assignment? That was the first real assignment. Okay, but uh, now you spent a week at uh, MAT, RDY? Oh, TDY, I think. Uh, I might have to take a look and under your armor school. Oh, um, that was eight weeks. Oh, officer, <laughs> officer material readiness school. That officer material readiness school, as I recall, was actually in Germany. Okay. Um, yeah, that's kind of the short story there is uh, arrive in Fulda, Germany. I'm the first lieutenant. I'm the first officer assigned to that unit in about a year because, again, middle of the Vietnam era, Everybody's leaving Germany, going to Vietnam, so I'm coming in. And the very first thing that they did with me is they sent me to basically, it was an officer maintenance school in Murnau, Germany. Um, and Ann and I, Ann accompanied me to that school. It was a one week school and we thought we had died and gone to heaven because we get there, we meet another couple that had been in Germany for a few months. They had a car and they said, rather than staying here in Murnau, why don't we stay in Garmisch, Germany and uh, commute back and forth to the school? So our first real taste of Germany was in the Bavarian Alps in Garmisch, Partenkirchen, Germany. So thanks to the fellow you met. <laughs> you betcha. That was the last uh, what I would call anything resembling time off and a real taste of the German culture for about a year. <laughs> So what, what, what did they teach you in this uh, officer readiness school? It was, uh, it was kind of a detailed one full week of here's how the Army maintenance program works. Here are all the responsibilities you would have if you were assigned as the maintenance officer in an armored unit. So at that point in time, were you planning on being an uh, armored maintenance officer? I had no intention whatsoever of being an Army or armor maintenance officer. I, that was not high on my list of things I wanted to do. So after, uh, after you finished that training, uh, what was your next uh, duty? Then right, uh, right into that platoon um, as an armor officer, tank commander, five M60 tanks. Um, we were there in October and very shortly thereafter, it was straight to, um, to um, Grafenwehr, Germany for tank gunnery training and Spent, spent the better part of a year as a tank platoon leader. And where, um, where were you located in Germany? We were in Fulda, um, which is... Where is that in relation to some other country? Uh, we were about 10 miles from the East German border. Um, so the, the closest major city would be Frankfurt, which was about probably about 90 miles south of us. So we were right there, I mean literally right on the East German border, which was an East German border at that time. So at that time we got the Cold War going on pretty hot and heavy? We're in the midst and middle of the Cold War. Um, we had responsibility for a large sector of the East German border. Uh, we, had, we had folks on that border continuously, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, but you know, back to the uh, kind of the progression of the assignments was from platoon leader in a tank platoon to uh, then I spent a, several months on regimental staff as the, um, what they call the S3 air officer. I was in the event of hostilities, I was the guy that was gonna be doing the coordination with the Air Force for any close air support that we would have as a CAV regiment sitting on the East German border. Um, from that assignment then I went on to the executive officer of, the, of Alpha Troop, which is a recon troop. And then shortly thereafter, um, I uh, took over as the CAV troop commander on the East German border as at that time a quote, senior first lieutenant and shortly thereafter promoted to captain. So you go from second lieutenant to captain in what short period of time? Uh, that was insane. Um, one year as a, as a second lieutenant, one year as a first lieutenant. So by the time I had completed two years in the army, I am now a company commander, 
troop commander, 186 young men, because at that time it was an all male army, 186 young men, nine M60 tanks, three mortar carriers, three infantry squads, uh, you know, a whole bunch of uh, uh, armored vehicle scouts. And I'm 24 years old and uh, kind of knew what I was doing. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was a pretty insane time. But, was, that, uh, was that a pretty daunting task when you first uh, were assigned that? No, it was, it was, it was overwhelming. Uh, it was truly overwhelming uh, at that point. And, and I think what complicated it as much as anything is, again, we're in the midst of the whole Vietnam era. We're in the big drawdown out of Europe. So we had very, very junior people in all positions. So my first sergeant was a Staff Sergeant E6, should have been a Master Sergeant E8. My squad leaders were all two and three year uh, at most experience in the Army. My platoon sergeants were maybe four or five years experience. So we were all uh, pretty inexperienced. Um, and, and, I, and I will tell you that initially I, I was really struggling trying to figure out how to maintain and control out of, of, of all of that that was going on. And then, then the good Lord shined upon me and uh, lo and behold, I get a new platoon or first sergeant assigned whose name was Patrick J. Rocco, and there are just some names in the Army you never forget. And that platoon, or that first sergeant was, was, the, was a person I will never, ever forget because he, he walked in as an experienced E-8 first sergeant, sat me down, and over the course of about two hours, we talked through what had been going on what I needed to do, what he needed to do, and, 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 and I, you, you get a feel for who Pat was because after we talked through all of the things that were going on, he, he kind of looks at me and goes like this. He goes, okay, sir, here's how it goes. Um, I pretty much take care of things here in Garrison and me and my NCOs will make sure that things get taken care of. And when we go to the field, then it's yours because you're the tactical guy and you run this operation in the field and we'll be talking continuously. The only thing I ask for you from you is keep your damn lieutenants out of my office. <laughs> you know, and so and so at that point I'm I'm kinda I'm kinda like so you stop whatever it is, you know, you do that. And, and it was kind of an interesting an aside because during those initial few months I was still a first lieutenant. So he constantly, I would hear, overhear him, he would go, well, the lieutenant needs this done or the lieutenant needs that done. Um, and then lo and behold, I get promoted to captain. I come back to the barracks. And from that point on, it was no longer the lieutenant. It was the old man wants this and the old man <laughs> wants that. So it was pretty interesting. Uh, Patrick Rocco, uh, classic old school soldier. Did you ever follow up with him after service? Did not lost track of Pat at that point uh, because when I left, when I left that assignment as a Cav Troop Commander, then I was off to Vietnam. But one thing I will uh, I kind of drop back on my 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 experiences as a Cav Troop Commander, and we had talked about it briefly before, but I was the Cav Troop Commander on the border in 1968 when the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia. You know, and I've I've talked to folks uh, about it and I've said that for about 36 hours I was probably as puckered up as tight there as I was at any time when I was in Vietnam because you know we obviously didn't have the intelligence assets that we do today we didn't really know what was going on um, at that time all the war plans talked about the Russian invasion would come through the Fulda Gap well I'm sitting right in the middle of the Fulda Gap um, and so until we knew what was going on, um, it was pretty, pretty concerning at that point. Um, and, and I will tell you, it, well, I guess what overwhelmed me as much as anything was um, I'm sitting on the border, we're combat loaded. Now I'm talking about, I've got a CAV troop completely deployed across the line. Um, we're combat loaded. So there are 105 rounds in the ready rack. There are 50 caliber ammunition in the bustle. Um, and I have a troop full of, and God bless them all, love them dearly, but I have a troop full of draftees. 
And, um, and I am just scared to death that I'm going to be the one that starts World War III because one of my guys is going to lob around off across the border and we will have started World War III. So uh, that was a pretty daunting experience. Now, uh, and in the middle of that, um, I, first sergeant comes up and kind of grabs me by the sleeve because I'm on the border because I'm not sleeping. I mean, I'm just like there. And uh, lo and behold, I hear the helicopter in the background. Here comes the three-star I Corps commander for Germany. And I'm this newbie captain sitting on the border. And uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was pretty overwhelming. So he comes in and we talk a little bit and we watch what's going on across the border and he leaves. But that's kind of a long way around. That was, uh, if, if I have a memorable moment out of the, the time in Germany, that was it. And then shortly thereafter was when I got received my orders to, uh, to head to Vietnam. Well, what, what was the, the thought behind why the Russians would, if they were going to make an incursion, why they would come through full to gap? Well, you know, it's, 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 it was all about geography. Um, you'd have to see the big Germany map and, and see what it looked like. But there's a, a big valley that runs right out of East Germany all the way through to Frankfurt. And so the mission of the, of the, of the CAV troops at that point, um, quite simply, was to run what we would call a delaying operation. If they ever did that, our, our mission was to slow them down. So the standing joke amongst all of us at the time was, you know, our mission was to litter the road with burning vehicles. It just didn't matter which ones, just, you know, you've got to slow them down on the way in. So, uh, right. but, what, uh, you remember what date it was that you uh, were told that you were going to be heading over to Vietnam? That would have been in, get it right, it would have been in, would have been in late August of 1968. How did you get that news? Um, <laughs> um, unofficially, um, the, the squadron personnel officer happened to live in the same building that Ann and I lived in with our, at that time, daughter. Um, uh, and I pull into the parking lot and he kind of looks over and goes, well, do you have any word yet on when you're actually leaving for Vietnam? And I'm like, I didn't know I was going. And he, you could tell he was just like, oh my, <laughs> you know, what did I just do here? So the, the short answer is then, um, then I got a call, official call to meet with the squadron commander who then delivered the news that I needed to be ready to leave by December of 1968 um, on the way to Vietnam. All right, uh, so uh, what kind of preparations did you have to make to uh, actually leave Germany and go over to Vietnam with the family and yourself? Well, it was um, another daunting task. It was a relatively short period of time. The whole routine about we didn't have that much to move because we were living in government quarters at that time. So it was like all of our personal gear had to be packed up and, you know, we had to make arrangements for where Ann was going to live and Ann and our daughter Laura at that time were going to live. So um, basically the decision was made that she was going to move back to Dayton um, and she was going to move in with her parents while I was in Vietnam. So that's where it, uh, that's what happened. Uh, and then, um, we loaded up and got on the airplane out of Frankfurt and flew back to Dayton. I had about, uh, I think I had about three weeks of leave time um, and then left Ann and our daughter and unbeknownst to me, left her about two weeks pregnant, but that's another whole story, um, with the second child. Um, and so off I go to, um, this is kind of hard to believe, but this was the Army at the time. I head to Fort Lewis, Washington in January. I'm so yes, that was what would have been late, early January. Left for Fort Lewis, Washington in January for my Vietnam training, which consisted of about a week of an orientation in Fort Lewis, Washington. And I, of course, at that time had my jungle fatigues and jungle boots and what have you and about five inches of snow on the ground. 
um, in Fort Lewis, Washington. Um, you know, and a little bit of an editorial commentary. When I take a look today at the kinds of training that we provide for the young women and young, young men and young women before they deploy, um, it's comprehensive, it's intensive, it's mission focused. Um, I could not have been any less prepared than what I was to go to Vietnam. Not a whole lot of snow over Vietnam. Not a whole lot of <laughs> snow, and the typical Vietnam village is not snow covered. Um, I had probably 20 rounds of ammunition through an M16, which I had never touched until I got there because I'm an armor guy. Um, and, um, and so it, we just, I was looking back on it, it's pretty amazing how, how little training that we had. Um, you know, and that was the time where there were units that were deployed, but once the unit was deployed, from that point on, it was all individual replacements. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, I think we were pretty poorly served by how that whole process worked out. Because I walked into Vietnam not having the foggiest notion what I was doing. How long were you in Fort Lewis? I think it was, I, as I recall, you know, a while ago, as I recall, it was about a week. You know, now, we, now we spend months training up. Where, where did you fly to, or how did you get over oh, to Vietnam? That fly was the, or the trip boat, from, or what? It was a trip from hell to get from uh, Fort Lewis, Washington to, to uh, Saigon, Vietnam. Um, it was one of those deals where we left Fort Lewis, um, then off to Travis Air Force Base, jumped on a chartered commercial air flight that took us from uh, Travis to Honolulu to Guam to Manila and then into Saigon. So that trip took about 30 hours. So I, you know, when we jokingly commented, um, they, they set that up purposely because by the time you were, you got to Vietnam, you were glad to be there. Uh, <laughs> glad to, to be off the plane. Get off that airplane because <laughs> it was a trip from God awful hell. So uh, where did you fly into it? Let's, well, Brian, can yeah. you see this all right? Well, let's find, let's find Saigon here. Flew into Saigon, um, and I spent about three days in Saigon because I had a MACV assignment, a Military Assistance Command Vietnam. So what I was going to be... What does that mean? That means my job was to go and work directly with the Vietnamese with, um, in their units, advising them on how to conduct their war on their ground in their country. A little editorial. Uh, but, but anyway, so I flew into Saigon, spent about three days there, and, and that's where, um, frankly, I, I had my first real disappointment because at that point, I'm still in my head. I'm still active duty Army. I have a regular Army commission, not a reserve commission. Um, I'm going to be a career Army officer. Um, and so in my head, I'm going to be with the 11th CAV or I'm going to be with a U.S. unit um, doing what I've been trained to do. And I get to Saigon and I find out that I'm going to Da Nang, which is way up. Uh, I got to get find my Da Nang on the border right there. I'm um, so I fly on a C-130 that I managed to finagle a ride on myself um, from Saigon to, to Da Nang. And I land in Da Nang um, right here. Right and, here. Um, you know, right there. I land in Da Nang, get off, and, and frankly, my order simply said, report to Mac Military Assistance Command Vietnam Headquarters in Da Nang. Um, and I had no assignment as such. It was just report to Military Assistance Command, uh, Vietnam, Da Nang. So I'm wandering around in the, in the, uh, in the air terminal and uh, I wander into a guy by the name of Bill Vile, Major Bill Vile. Um, and he's assigned there coming in. I don't know where he was coming from, but we're both in the same airport at the same time. And um, he asked me where I'm going. I'm going like, I'm just going to headquarters, uh, Mac V. Da Nang. And we talked a little bit about what I'd done. And uh, I, I mentioned, I don't know how the subject came up, but I said something about, 
Well, one of the last things that I did while I was in Germany was I attended a two-week school uh, at Ramstein Air Base in air ground operations. And, and Major Vile kind of looked at me and he went, I'm the G3 for MACV and Da Nang, and I'm short a S3 air liaison officer. So why don't you come with me <laughs> And we're gonna go talk to the personnel people. And so my assignment then turned out to be the S3 air liaison to the Vietnamese in i -Corps, which essentially meant that I was the guy that would work directly with my Vietnamese counterpart in securing US air assets in support of the Vietnamese in i -Corps. Did any of your job assignments uh, take you out of Dan Da Nang? Uh, the, the only time I was really out of Da Nang for any length of time was I spent, um, oh, I know this one, I don't even know where they can find it. I spent about a week in Udorn Thani, Thailand. Uh, and I don't even know that I, I should have done Thailand a little bit of homework there. Here. Yeah, I'm trying to look for, I'm not, oh, here we go. And you even have a little airplane signal or uh, insignia right there, Udon Thani, Thailand, because I needed an out-of-country air briefing on what was going on outside of, of Vietnam. And so I jumped on a little O2 push-pull Cessna airplane with a Marine Lieutenant Colonel and an Air Force Major, and we flew over Laos <laughs> you know, uh, into, into Thailand where I secured my uh, my, my week's worth of briefing on air operations out of country. And that's where I learned about what was going on with the infamous Ho Chi Minh Trail and all of the activity that was, was going on there. Um, Were we allowed to do any uh, assault of the, the traffic on the Ho Chi Minh Trail? Not allowed to do a thing at that point. Um, that was because it was out of our sector, it was out of our area, we couldn't do anything at that point. Ultimately, we did do operate, we did do air operations on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, depending upon exactly where it was, um, but did never, never really did what needed to be done, which was an actual interdiction of it, because you just simply can't control anything unless you have literally boots on the ground. So that's kind of a long way around what was going on at that point. Um, I will tell you that my big surprise when I was at the, uh, at the airport in Udon, Thailand was um, saw these funny little airplanes that were all over that airfield that had a little insignia on them called Air America. Um, and so I made the mistake of asking these two highly classified, uh, cleared officers about w what's with all those airplanes there that say Air America on them? And they just kind of grinned and went, that's kind of above your security clearance. Well, obviously the whole world knows that was the CIA operations that was going on and they were flying out of Thailand. So learned lots of things uh, when I was there. But, but anyway, back to, uh, back to the issue of my assignment. So I spent my entire uh, time in Vietnam as either the, um, the S3 Air, which I did for about seven months or so. And then um, at that point, I don't know exactly how my name came out of the hat. It was a really interesting assignment, but certainly not what I wanted. Found myself as the Secretary General Staff to the Senior Army Advisor in i -Corps, which for most folks quite simply means I was the guy that handled everything that came to the, the, the boss of the entire Military Assistance Command operation um, in i -Corps. Uh, worked directly for the commanding general. Um, interesting assignment because here I am, relatively junior captain, um, kind of in on what was going on across that entire region. Um, did have an opportunity to spend a little bit of time with some of the Vietnamese CAV units, but that time was just was minimal and I frankly was never involved in any real engagement with them. Um, so most of my time and well, almost all of my time in, in Vietnam was i -Corps, um in f really some pretty significant staff operations, but nonetheless, that's what I did. The other thing I'll mention is I kind of go random abstract here in that S3 air operation job. The one thing that really was pretty exciting um, 
was one of my responsibilities was I had to clear all of the arc like strikes that went into I Corps. Well, what do you mean by that? Uh, the the six aircraft B fifty two strikes that uh, that went into I Corps, we had to be certain that there were no Vietnamese North or South Vietnamese in those areas that we were taking those aircraft into. So my job South was Vietnam about South pardon? Vietnamese citizens or military. Uh, yes, either one. Either one to the extent that we knew where the civilians were. But anyway, um, so what made that most interesting was I would get the phone call that something was going to happen about two hours before the strikes actually occurred. So that meant the airplanes were already in the air when I got the phone call. And that phone call could come at any time of the day or night. It was not at all unusual for me to get a phone call in my hooch at three o'clock in the morning that said, you need to go clear this strike and you need to do it right now. And what made that exciting was um, driving across Da Nang at three o'clock in the morning by yourself uh, got pretty exciting um, because, you know, you're in the midst of the middle of a war zone. Um, there's lots of uh, the, the, the security system in Da Nang were all what they call regional forces, popular forces. Um, and, and quite frankly, they were very poorly trained. So as, as I'm driving across an area in which no one's supposed to be out after 10 o'clock at night in a quarter ton by myself, uh, it, it was a little anxiety provoking. Um, to get to the, the operations center where I would then have to clear that with my Vietnamese counterpart. They would tell me that, no, there are no Vietnamese units in there. And then I would go ahead and, and clear the strike to, uh, uh, to be completed. So, so when they told you there were no Vietnamese units in there, did they also tell you there were no Vietnamese citizens in there? Did not tell me there were no Vietnamese citizens that were in there. They told me there were no Vietnamese units that were in there. Um, now, if there, if there were known citizens in there, um, I never had it happen where one of those strikes was going into anything resembling a populated area. Um, I'm confident, given the relationship that I had with my Vietnamese counterpart, um, that if there were citizens in there, I would have known about it and we would have called that strike. We would have called it off. So, Give me an idea of what, how one of those strikes would, uh, would function. Uh, you've, got a, you've got a phone call two hours before. Where are these? B-29s coming from? They're coming out of Guam. Okay. Uh, they, they would come in out of Guam, the ones that, that I'm aware of would come in out of Guam. I mean, they literally were in the air um, before I would get the clearance. And, and, and I just bluntly stated the reason why there was such short notice was we knew that there were lots of leaks within the Vietnamese units. And if uh, if there was too much advance notice, a target that might be in that target box would be gone by the time the, uh, the strike actually occurred. Okay. So it was, a, it was a pretty closely timed um, operation. How many planes would uh, customarily be in one of these? Uh, there would be six. Six? Normally six. And what are they carrying? They are carrying lots and lots of bombs, 500-pound um, bombs. I forget the number. Um, I know that I was in the air in a forward air controller aircraft one time uh, at a distance where we observed it going in. Um, and it is an awesome sight. It will absolutely pulverize an area about a mile long uh, and about a half mile wide. It's just complete devastation. And I can tell you that that whole, once they started going in, that little aircraft that I was in was doing this number the entire time because all the concussion waves coming off of that. And how high were you? What altitude were you? We were probably at about 5,000 feet. The B-52s were probably at about 30,000 feet, that is. You know, we could, we could see them, but that was about it. Well, I've, I've heard and read uh, during the Second World War that, uh, you know, that a lot of times these Airstrikes didn't even hit their targets, but over Vietnam, were these uh, pretty uh, sophisticated uh, 
bomb sites and pretty sophisticated uh, bombardiers. Yeah, I'm, I'm confident. Yeah, I'm confident they were they were in their target box. I'm not confident there was a target there, but they were in their target box. So yeah, there. I don't know of any. Um, I don't know personally know of any incidents that there were unanticipated casualties as a consequence of. Uh, of a of a missed strike of a poorly placed strike. Did the uh, North Vietnamese or the Chinese have any uh, aircraft that uh, could attack these B twenty nines at night? Uh, the uh, um, short answer is no. Um, there was not not in South Vietnam. Um, now I, I not in my sector in South Vietnam did I know of any. B uh, B fifty two strike. B fifty two. Where we, we yeah where we lost where we lost any aircraft. Now there were a bunch of B fifty twos that were lost um, over North Vietnam, but uh, from but other aircraft or from uh, ground primarily fire? primarily from missile ground fire. I'm probably exclusively from missile ground fire. Now that's not true for the high performance aircraft. There were there were jet fighter dogfights, if you will, and the Vietnamese did tell their own in, uh, in that kind of combat. Okay. I said B-29. B yeah, I'm, World I'm a, II. I'm a generation. World II. Not quite. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> All right. So uh, what would you say? You did about six of these uh, airstrikes? Oh, I, shoot, I can't. I would say we probably did at least two or three a month. So, probably 20. And after the airstrikes, uh, would you get any report back? As oh, we constantly got reports back. I question the validity of the reports that we got back, but yes. Yeah, we, there was always bomb da damage assessment that was done. Um, it kind of depended, you know, if it was a high performance aircraft, um, Depended on where the strike was, what the target was, what have you, um, in, in terms of what I would believe the accuracy of it was. Um, but yeah, yeah, there was always a bomb damage. There was a bomb damage assessment report done for every strike that went in. Was that more publicity and political than it was uh, accurate? I would suggest that in the 12 months that we were there, if you were to believe the bomb damage assessment reports, we would have probably annihilated the entire population of South Vietnam, certainly in ICOR. Uh, yeah, yeah, they were clearly were inflated. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no question about that. And, you know, and, and that was in the era of uh, everything was done statistically. Everybody was concerned about the numbers. You know, I hate to bring up the topic because it flares up in my head, but, you know, it was the old body count that, uh, you know, there was an awful lot of pressure put on a lot of commanders to create a body count, and uh, so they created a body count. Be sure there were more dead of them than there were of us? Um, I'm <laughs> sure there, I'm reasonably confident the short answer on that would be yes, but not by the statistics that we presented. But where you were stationed, uh, were you the subject of any attacks? Um, <laughs> da Nang was kind of rocket city. Um, yeah, we would we would frequently have um, I refer to them as to whom it may concern rocket attacks would come in. Um, generally, they would come in and you know sometime after midnight, um, and you know it was a kind of a constant concern. Um, but they were they were to whom it may concern. Uh, they were not targeted on, for example, I Corps headquarters or what have you, because they just simply weren't that good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and we all had our little rituals, you know, you go to bed at night at whatever time it is that you were going to bed at night. And in my case, it was, I had a bunk um, and the ritual was the flak jacket got laid out, the helmet got laid out on the floor. Um, the M16 was laid on the floor right next to the flak jacket. The 45 was on the nightstand. Um, you know, and the rockets would start coming in, and you just roll out of you roll out of the rack, you roll into your flak jacket, you grab your your rifle, your helmet, and you basically crawl under the bunk, and wait for it to to clear out. Did we do we have some close calls? Yeah, I had a, 
I had a door blown in on top of me. Uh, um, uh, yeah, they just, they happened, but casualties, uh, frankly, far more civilian casualties as a result of those rocket attacks on Da Nang than there were military casualties. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, uh, they also were pretty successful in a couple of other areas. They, they uh, at one point, um, da Nang Air Base was an extremely active facility and uh, the bad guys managed to put some rockets on the uh, ammunition supply oh. point there. So we had about 24 hours of... Fourth of July. Of, I mean, it was unbelievable. Uh, we, you could stand and you could, you could see concussion waves coming at you. Uh, you know, it was one of those deals where you'd kind of peek out around the building, look around, you could s literally see the concussion wave coming and step back in. And not that it would have done that much damage to you, but it was just, it was pretty, pretty awesome. Well, was it was a uh, ammunition uh, area kind of uh, uh, separated from where yeah. the troops were? Yeah, it was it was well separated. I, I frankly, as I recall, I don't think there were any casualties associated with it. But boy, there was an awful lot of damage done um, and an awful lot of uh, pretty much shut down, as you might imagine, and shut down operations for about two days. There, there were no airplanes taking off and landing for a while. Now the airplanes that were stationed there were those fighter planes. Or fighter yeah, those bombers? were those were all basically F four Phantoms. Um, um, Air Force periodically you'd have a, you know I wouldn't know exactly why they were coming in. Periodically we would get some Navy and some Marine um, uh, aircraft in, but uh, that was an, an Air Force base and a very very active one. Well, as par as part of your job, did you have to uh, assign? Uh, some of those pilots out for ground support for any actions? I didn't assign pilots. What I did was I went to the Air Force um, with a request. I basically um, had had a counterpart, active duty Air Force counterpart, that once I had coordinated with my Vietnamese counterpart, saw what they wanted, made sense, ran it past, past my boss to make sure that my boss blessed it as an appropriate request for support. Because quite frankly, a lot of times they would ask for way more support than what they actually needed, or oftentimes than what we had available. But but we would coordinate that, work that out, and then I would contact my Air Force counterpart and would authorize the the the, uh, the assignment, and then the Air Force would take it over and let us know whether they could fly it or not. Um, it was that the Air Force had decided whether they were going to use fighters or whether they were going to use helicopter yeah. support. Well, this helicopter support I went to the Army for. Yeah. So we had we had army aviation army aviation assets that were available, um, and when, for example, a Vietnamese Ranger or infantry unit needed um, helicopter support, my job was to coordinate that with the army counterpart with the uh, aviation support unit in the army. So I did both the the fixed air and the and the rotary wing support. So, do you know anything about the uh, casualty rate of the helicopters? Uh, Probably a lot of those guys uh, really, really suffered those helicopters in ground support. Yeah, there's, there's been a lot written about casualty rates with, um, with, with pilots um, and, and, and helicopters, and, and it was fairly substantial. Now, you know, it was, it was kind of bizarre for me because um, I would be doing all of this coordination back and forth to secure the support, but I never really knew. The, the, the pilots that were flying, yeah, I'd go out and do a little grip and grin on the ground and say hello and what have you, but as far as day-to-day -day contact with them, didn't have much contact with them mostly. I was the guy that was running the interference between the, the South Vietnamese units and the U.S. assets for support. So uh, you're a captain during all this time? Captain during all that time. Um, you know, and, and kind of the, the personal story was captain during all this time, very un, frankly, very unhappy with my assignment because that's not what I thought I was gonna go over there to do. Um, and, and, and it was during that period where I made the decision that, um, you know, I don't think this is for me. Um, you know, and it didn't escape me that um, the assignments that I had and it's going to sound kind of crazy, but nonetheless, it's the way I viewed it. Um, the assignments that I had were not career enhancing for me. And I just kind of looked out in front and went, it's not going to work. So, um, 
So right before I left Vietnam, um, I was talking to officer personnel and, and basically said, okay, my next assignment, you all need to know right up front. I'm, I'm, as soon as I'm eligible to, to, to leave, I'm going to leave. Um, however, I've been out of country now for four years and I have very little contacts out there at all. So is there some way that you can get me a one year assignment at Fort Knox um, so that at least gets me in a position where I have a year to kind of adjust and, and get myself ready for what's going to be my civilian life. And much to my shock, that's exactly what they did. Um, and so my last active duty Army assignment was at Fort Knox, Kentucky, where I was an instructor in the, uh, in the Army School uh, teaching CAV operations which is back to what I'd been doing when I was in Germany and back to what I was expecting to be doing when I was in Vietnam. So you're a lot happier at Fort Knox, but, uh, oh, but did that change your outlook on being career no, military? No, no, that did not. I just, at that point, I was kind of embittered by, you know, what my experience had been and from a, you know, just a personal perspective. And some of it had to do with, one, I was unhappy with the experiences that I had had in Vietnam. Um, because again, when I was there initially, I'm going in there as a gung-ho active army guy, going to make a career out of this. I need to get out there and get my hands dirty and do what needs to be done. Um, and the other piece of it, quite frankly, was one of, let me make sure I've got this right. I've been in the army now for almost five years. I've been out of country four years. Um, I have a wife and now two daughters that hardly know who I am and I, just I'm not sure this is what I want the rest of my life to be like. So I need to do something different, and that's what I did. So when did you, when did you uh, get released from the military? I, it was December, January 69, January 70, Vietnam. So it would have been December of uh, 69 or thereabouts uh, when I separated from the Army. And at that time, um, knew that I had some challenges in front of me in terms of retraining, securing a career, um, and trying to figure out how to support a wife and two daughters while all this is going on. Well, how did you get back stateside? How did you get, where'd you fly from, Da Nang or I, I, Saigon? I flew, from Den I flew from Da Nang back to Saigon, Saigon to Yokota, Japan, Yokota, Japan nonstop to uh, back to San Francisco was where I ended up and, and did the, uh, interesting you should ask the question, the timing's right, back to San Francisco, um, where I did what so many of us did at that time, which was, of course, you had to travel in uniform because you're on a, you know, a military chartered flight, travel in uniform. So I'm in my jungle fatigues, if you will, traveling back to San Francisco and the first thing I did, of course, was grab my ditty bag that I was carrying with me and head straight for the men's room and got out of that uniform as quickly as I could. And because I knew what was coming. Now, how did you know what was coming? Um, we had access to the armed services radio and, and various other forms of communication and letters from home and what have you. So had an idea about what was going on back, going on back home. So and was forewarned. You didn't, you didn't face any of that though, because you got changed. No, right away. I just I just immediately changed and um, and got out of uniform and flew from San Francisco back to Dayton, Ohio. So, so you come back to Dayton, you see the family, and what did you decide to do career-wise then? Well, saw the family, got back to Dayton, went to Fort Knox, spent a year um, teaching the armor school. Really enjoyed that experience, but then. Um, Got to the point to where it was end of term of service, uh, resigned my regular army commission, um, and then uh, ended up uh, in grad school at the University of Dayton, um, where I retrained to, of all things, become a school psychologist. Spent about 13 years in, in that career. How long um, did it take you to get your degree in psychology? Uh, yeah, well, I got really, really fortunate on that too. Um, Got that done, uh, including my internship in two years. Um, and during that time, I did a little bit of everything. I had GI Bill, drove a 
trust truck for Wagner Wood Lumber Company, picked up a graduate assistantship um, at the University of Dayton in, in, that, in the uh, school psych program. Got my internship done, got it finished, immediately had two job offers, went to work, did school psych for about 13 years, and then where at uh, Miamisburg. I was, uh, first year was halftime Miamisburg, West Carrollton. Um, that was the job offer I had at that point. Then the end of that year, I had a job offer from both West Carrollton and Miamisburg, elected to, to make the move to Miamisburg where I spent the rest of my career, ended up as the uh, deputy superintendent at Mimersburg Schools, um, retired from that in, um, in 2001, um, actually September of 2001, a rather significant time frame in the history of this country, um, but um, in 2001, and then uh, failed retirement a couple of times, uh, went back and was asked to come back to Mimersburg uh, I had a superintendent that was retiring and asked if I'd come back and fill in for six months, which turned into 18 months, and then reminded them there was a reason why I left, you know, and then worked uh, at that point then. I was very fortunate. I picked up a, uh, a, a very part-time position with the Montgomery County Board of Education running uh, an assessment team, kind of going back to what I did initially as a school psych and did that on a part-time basis, which I thought was going to be for a couple of years, turned out to be 10. <laughs> um, you know, and, you know, and and, and left that, um, and actually retired. Actually retired about six years ago. So. So what got you into the field of psychology? Um, <laughs> that, almost embarrassed to admit it, but it goes like this. So here I am, just out of the army, looking for what am I going to do. I, my bachelor's degree was in um, arts and science as a history government major. I had a secondary major in, in education, so I had a teaching certificate. Um, and there were, there were absolutely zero jobs available at that point in time for that, so I knew I had to retrain. So I'm going through the catalog trying to figure out, you know, what am I going to do? And lo and behold, there's this thing called school psychologist, and it has a paid internship. And I'm like, wife? two daughters, paid internship, and it's a high demand position. That's what I'm gonna do. And that's precisely <laughs> what I ended up doing. <laughs> worked, you know, worked out great. I mean, had a, had a great career um, and, and it worked out well. But, you know, to kind of revisit or, or, or go back to my departure from, um, from the Army, because of the situation I was in, um, I'm looking at this Army Reserve and I'm, you know, maybe I can do that on a part-time basis. Well, that's a long convoluted story there too, but the Army Reserve basically said, you're a captain, you've got data rank, and, and we're really not interested in you guys. So you might want to go talk to those National Guard people that are down the hallway. So that's what I did. And uh, once again, my, my goal was to uh, was to do that for a couple of years while I'm in grad school so that I can pick up a few extra bucks and support a family. Well, that two years turned into uh, 23. Um, and, and so I ended up uh, actually concurrently running a career in the public school system and uh, in the Ohio Army National Guard um, for that 23 years. Now in the Army National Guard, uh, what positions did you have? You were a staff officer and what else? I was so unbelievably fortunate because I spent nearly 10 years of my Army Guard career as either a battalion commander or in today's world the equivalent of a brigade commander. Um, I, had, I had 10 years of doing what I wanted to do when I was on active duty. Um, so yeah, I had, some, I had a lot of staff time, got to do a lot of different things. But, but really the crowning jobs for me and what kept me in it was the fact that I had an opportunity to do hands-on command work as a battalion and a brigade commander. Did that for 10 years, which is kind of unheard of. Um, but I kept reminding folks that things are working okay, so I'm perfectly happy doing what I'm doing. You know, leave me alone. And they did, and I'm very grateful for that. So when was it that you graduated from Army Command and General Staff Oh, course? dear Lord. Uh, War College was 84. 
So command and general staff, I don't remember exactly what it would have been, but it was in the 70s. So, uh, and then um, now that, that kind of leads into, I was uh, once again, extremely fortunate because I was selected um, to attend Army War College. Um, and, and that was a big, that was a big career boost for me. Um, it was a tough, tough haul because I had to do it like so many of the reserve component folks. It had to be done um, over a two year period of time as in correspondence and, um, and also in attendance at, at Carlisle Barracks. Um, Pennsylvania? Yeah. Beautiful location, golly gee. That was a great, great time when you were on, on site there. But uh, very, very fortunate. Um, had a great career in the Army Guard, got to do all kinds of crazy things. We talked about it briefly, but people get a little astounded to learn that a major t part of my command time as a brigade commander, I spent wandering around the Aleutian Islands because the, at that time the 371st Corps Support Group had the wartime planning mission for defense, the logistics support of the defense of the Aleutian Islands. So I spent time on Adak and Shemya and got all the way out to Attu and Cold Bay and Kodiak and, you know, I'd jokingly comment that I can't believe the Army paid me to go fishing in the Buskin River for salmon and Kodiak because on our off-duty off time, uh, which gets me kind of interesting in Alaska because if you get there in the middle of the summer, um, I do have a photograph at home where I'm reading the newspaper on Adak. Um, at about three o'clock in the morning because it just doesn't get dark. So we would be on Kodiak, we'd get off duty, we'd head out to go fishing and somebody would look down at a watch and go, damn, it's two o'clock in the morning, guys. We gotta get out of here and get back and get, at least get a couple hours sleep. Well, that's no big deal for a day, but about, after about the third day of that, it starts to get a little, little wearing. But anyway, um, I, I digress, yeah. Got to do some really, really neat things um, in the Guard. Spent time in Germany, spent time um, in Hawaii, spent time in the Aleutian Islands. Got to do a lot of different really neat things. Benning. And all over continental United States. Bragg, Benning, Riley, uh, Fort Hood, Texas. Spent a lifetime there, one three week period of time. Uh, you know. <laughs> so we, we haven't heard anything about uh, how you progressed from uh, being a captain to uh, where you ended up. I just uh, amazingly fortunate, um, got really, really neat assignments, uh, got to do a lot of different things. Um, promotions came on, on schedule. Uh, it was kind of peculiar because when I resigned my active duty regular army commission um, and joined the guard, if you will, I lost all my data rank as a captain, so I had to go back to year zero uh, with a reserve commission um, as a captain. But got the right assignments, uh, spent time um, doing staff work and with initially was an air defense artillery unit. And then um, that converted to a logistics support unit and spent some staff time doing that. Um, then picked up an assignment as an executive officer of a transportation battalion, which was located in Middletown, Ohio. Had a great, uh, great experience there. Um, when, my, when my commander uh, was promoted and moved, uh, moved out of that battalion command position, I was assigned as the commander there. Uh, spent five years in Middletown as commander of the transportation battalion. What rank? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel at that point. Um, major is always a staff job, uh, unless you're an Army aviator. Um, captain to major, that's all staff time. Um, and then lieutenant colonel, all my, virtually all my, almost all of my lieutenant colonel time um, was a commander at, with the transportation battalion. Went from there to the executive officer as a lieutenant colonel in what at that time was a 371st Corps support group in Kettering, Ohio. Um, spent about a year as exec in that unit. That commander then uh, retired um, and I was appointed commander, got almost five years as commander of the uh, 371st Corps Support Group. During that time um, was Desert Storm 1 um, 
and almost the entire core support group was mobilized for that. All of our transporters, all of our, um, let's see, transporters, military police, uh, had a water purification detachment, almost all of the organic units to that uh, core support group were mobilized for Desert Storm. None of the headquarters were, that's a long story about how that happened, but I'll not spend any time on that. But anyway, but all they were all mobilized, so that was a really, really eventful period of time. There was a year in which I was basically a full-time core group commander because we had units coming and going continuously. What was your rank then? I was, I was colonel then. I was colonel, uh, full colonel, uh, bird colonel, whatever term you want to use. Um, and uh, like I said, I was very fortunate. I had almost five years doing that. Um, and then I ran out of time. They just basically said, you got to go. You can't stay in that command any longer. You're holding up those behind you. So I uh, was then assigned to the state headquarters for about two years doing, for lack of a better term, odd jobs. And then unbelievably fortunate, got the tap on the shoulder to become the assistant adjutant general for training for the Ohio Guard. And that was the promotion to brigadier general. And I, I did that for three years. Um, and then at that point, it was more like a staff job and it was a command job. And at that point, I kind of looked around and I went, you know what, three years is long enough of this stuff. And that's when I retired. So I retired in, um, in uh, it would have been December of 1994. That's really not the whole story because another precipitating event, if you will, was uh, about, it would have been November 1st, 1994, uh, was when I had a triple bypass surgery, which came out of nowhere. I had no clue that there was an issue until one day I'm out doing my evening run and uh, for a few seconds felt like somebody had stabbed me in the middle of the back. Then it went away, but my thought at the time was, that's not right. Was fortunate enough to go see the doc and to make a long story longer. Uh, the outcome of that was triple bypass surgery. Um, at, before that happened, there was an outside chance that I might have been able to uh, pick up the position as the commanding general for the armor brigade, or the armor brigade that was shared between uh, Indiana and uh, Ohio. But once that bypass surgery occurred, it was pretty clear to me that that was no longer a viable option. So, uh, so I retired in December of uh, 1994 out of the Ohio Guard. As a Brigadier General? As a Brigadier General. All right, uh, I think we've covered about uh, everything with your employment. Uh, brought this along. Can you tell the, <coughs> the viewers and listeners what, uh, what that is? Well, that's, that, that is, I, I kept the original citation. As, a, as an advisor to the Vietnamese, I had an end of tour um, award um, presented to me by then Lieutenant General uh, Lam, um, the commander of I-Corps, the Vietnamese commander of I-Corps. Um, and this was the all in Vietnamese award certificate for that uh, gallantry cost with, uh, with Silver Star. You know, and- And you brought this picture? I brought, I brought this photograph along and it's always good for a, for, a, for a laugh for anyone who knows me. That's General Lam actually making the presentation of the award. On, and, the, uh, on the left there. Yeah, this is General Lam right here and of course, this is, this is the skinny version of, of Bill LaPreeze. This is um, uh, about 135 or 140 pounds of, of Bill LaPreeze after having spent 12 months wandering around in Vietnam. And you brought another photo of somebody that looks familiar in the middle. Well, it doesn't look too familiar to anybody that knows me now. Um, this is, this is First Lieutenant William LaPreeze at the change of command ceremony where I became commander you know, on the back of it, January 15, 1968, where I became commander A Troop, 1st Squadron, 14th Armored Cavalry Regiment. Where? That's in Fulda, Germany. And, and that, isn't that a kind of a cute little headgear that we have in those days? <laughs> <laughs> well, how did you like Germany? 
we, we love Germany. Now, having said that, remember, Vietnam era, big drawdown. Um, in two and a half years of assignment in Germany, um, I, we were able to scratch out a total of 12 days of leave um, because you just couldn't go because you couldn't be away because there wasn't anybody in the backfill for you. So didn't get much time off, but we took full advantage of the time off that we did have. A lot of stuff went on in the local area, in Fulda, in the town surrounding. We, we got to visit Rotenburg and we got to Garmisch and we got to do some of that stuff um, on weekends um, when, when we weren't actually on the border. So love Germany and love Germany. Um, we were there at the perfect time to be there for all intents and purposes because the exchange rate at that time was four to one. So it was four German marks to a US dollar. So we could go downtown full to Germany, um, have Chateau Briand for two with a bottle of wine and dessert and what have you, and you could not spend $15. It just was, you know, it was an amazing time to be there from that perspective. Um, but, but there really wasn't a lot of time to travel. We did manage to sneak in one 11 day uh, leave and we didn't waste any time on that one because in 11 days we went from Fulda to Garmisch to Innsbruck, Austria to Vienna, to Rome, to Laverno, to, I'm trying to think of, well, back through Zurich and then back to Fulda. So we took full advantage of the 11 days we had. Love Germany. You told me about a little incident where you went to uh, an establishment uh, and you didn't stay very long. Oh. <laughs> well, it's, it's all about, call it situational awareness, I guess, because um, this was um, while I was in the guard and we were working with a U.S. transportation unit that was obviously signed in Germany. So we were in Kaiserslautern and had an evening off, so I kind of gathered my staff guys together and we all decided we we're gonna go out to dinner. So we jump in a taxi and I just basically said to the taxi driver, you know, just take us someplace where we can get a beer and dinner and so off we go. So we walk into this little guest house restaurant what have you and we walk in the door and we aren't probably 20 feet into it and the place went stone cold silent you know i mean make the hair stand up on the back of your neck stone cold silent and i'm like what's going on here and then i kind of glanced around and i'm like oh my uh i'm looking at the age of the occupants of that guest house and uh they're all about World War II age. And it was pretty clear that we weren't welcome there. You know, I'd like to tell you that, you know, well, how could they tell? Well, you bring a bunch of U.S. Army soldiers in. None of us had any hair. Well, I don't even have any hair now. But, but uh, at that time, it was cut off, not gone. Um, but walked in, and, you know, and, and obviously they knew who we were. And it was obvious that we weren't very welcome. And needless to say, I just kind of looked around and said, guys, you know what, <laughs> we're out of here. And we just turned around and left and managed to hail down a taxi and, and moved off. But I thought that was rather, uh, that was the, the first real, you're really not welcome here experience I ever had in Germany. Um, around the border towns, they loved us. Uh, I mean, at that time with the East German border as it was, um, the, the local population were happy to have us there. Um, and, and we had talked before, the further away you got from the border, perhaps the little less welcome that you were, but around the border towns, they loved you. Um, but that was the first real, you're just not welcome here experience I had in Germany. First and only, really. When you were traveling around Germany, either uh, during your service or when you were in the, in the guards, uh, did you see any uh, sites that had been uh, bombed out uh, during the war? Um, truthfully, no. I never saw any real um, example of that. Um, it, it was interesting wandering around, for example, the training areas. Wielflecken was, uh, was one of our train, training areas, and that was an old Hitler 
um, stable uh, vacation site, what have you, and, and wandering around there was pretty interesting just because of the historical significance of it. But as far as any real damage, uh, I never saw any evidence of it whatsoever, none. Uh, tell us what some of your medals are. Oh, okay, well let me see if I can do this in something that resembling some, sem some semblance of order here. Um, I did this on purpose because this is kind of the beginning and the end. Um, in my right hand is the Superior Cadet Award because now I'm gonna break my arm patting myself on the back. Um, as I said, I, I uh, graduated University of Dayton and was commissioned regular army, which was a bit unusual. Uh, there was a small percentage of the ROTC graduates that are, uh, are able to, to choose to accept a regular army commission I did. This was the Superior Cadet Award that I received as the, as the top uh, ROTC student in my graduating class. That was the very first Army Award that I ever received. This is a Legion of Merit, and this is the last End of Service Award that I received. So I kind of keep these two together because this is kind of the, the beginning and the end of, of Bill's Army career. So that, that pretty much takes care of that. Now, I, I brought the, <laughs> Ann and I have had a little discussion about how did this happen, I mean, we, haven't, we haven't quite figured it out. But uh, these are, these are my, my miniatures, these are all of the awards that I received or was awarded at one time or another while I was in the Army. You know, and I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but this is the Bronze Star. Let's see if I can hold this up in a way that's a little more viewable. Yep. And the Bronze Star yeah. was awarded for, yeah. for uh, this what? This is for meritorious service. This is not a Valor Award. This is a meritorious service award. Um, kind of the standing joke in, in Vietnam at one point was you, you couldn't get out of Vietnam without a, a, without a meritorious service award, a boarding pass, and a SECO watch. So, uh, so that was my, my meritorious service award. Um, Army Commendation Medal, there's my Vietnamese Gallantry Cross that, uh, that I was awarded. And um, the rest of these tend to be meritorious service and or um, you had a couple of mobilizations and typically those are awarded with some kind of recognition. And then of course this is the miniature of, uh, of the Legion of Merit. So those are, those are the sum total of 28 years of Army experience. Well, uh, I think we've pretty well covered everything. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you feel that would be interesting about your uh, civilian career or your military career, family? I, you, know, you know, nothing, no, no single event as such, but, but I will tell you that in spite of my whining about my, my Vietnam experience and what have you, I, I would suggest to you that um, the experiences that I had in the Army um, were a major contributor to whatever success I had in my civilian career. Um, because quite frankly, in the public education business, I kind of came in with a different mindset and a different perspective than an awful lot of my, of my counterparts. Um, you know, and, and introduced, uh, you, I, sometimes I'd get a little overwhelmed with some of the verbiage and what have you would float around and I kept, I would constantly insist on Mission condition standard. What's the mission? Under what condition? To what standard is this to be performed? And I don't care how complex the task is, if you ask yourself the question, what's the mission? Under what conditions is it to be performed? And what's the standard? If you meet all three of those, you can just about get anything organized and done. Um, and I brought that in and I even brought in the, the, the infamous Army staff study because you get these big, long, crazy reports that would show up in the school business and I would go, if it can't be done on one page, it's too much information. So summarize it for me on one page and we'll, uh, we'll work, on, uh, work off of that. So let's go from there. But again, I, I would attribute an awful lot of the success that I had um, in my civilian career and frankly in my life uh, with, with my Army experiences. One of those classic, we all talk about it, wouldn't trade it for anything. There's pieces of it I would never want to do again for anything. But bottom line is, uh, 
I'm still very much a supporter of the Army. I spent 10 years um, after retirement as a civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army uh, for the uh, Southern re region of Ohio. Um, that was a tremendous experience. Uh, enjoyed the opportunity to do that. Um, and I'm still uh, very active. Uh, Major Samuel Woodfield chapter of the Association of the United States Army is actually executive uh, board. It works out of the Cincinnati area. And I continue to, uh, to work on that executive board to work with those folks. So still a big Army supporter. Now you have a relative uh, you were telling me about that uh, doesn't like to talk about his experiences. Uh, yeah, I do. I have, I have a brother-in-law uh, who has a very, very different story to tell about Vietnam than I do. Uh, Dave, uh, Dave was a Navy corpsman um, assigned to a Marine infantry unit in the same place where I was in, in I Corps. Um, but in Dave's case, the, the um, he was on the ground for 365 days providing direct support to a combat infantry marine unit that was up to their elbows and alligators the entire time they were there. Think way, if you've done any of the studies about what on, went on in Vietnam, think that whole way, way citadel, uh, that, that whole upper demilitarized zone area, think Quezon, think all of that. That's what Dave was in the middle of. Um, so uh, he and I tell stories and we kind of commiserate with each other, but uh, he had a very, very different experience than I did. From, from your training as a psychologist, what, 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 how do you feel about that? About, about, about him and his experience? And, and I, I will tell you that um, w without, without belaboring the point, um, it, it clearly has impacted his, his life, period. There's no question about that. Um, it, it took him a long time to um, adjust, I guess, for back, lack of a better term. Um, and, and frankly, in my opinion, he's still experiencing some pretty major physical uh, consequences of what he experienced. Um, I, I am absolutely convinced that his physical ailments right now are directly related to his experiences while he was in Vietnam. Um, exposed to Agent Orange? Oh, he was Agent Orange exposed. Well, shoot, all of us were. That if you were an I Corps, I mean, well, that's we didn't talk about that. But one of the other things I did was I cleared the Agent Orange drops um, that went on in I Corps. Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, he was ex he was exposed to all of that, and he has some pretty significant physical issues that he's dealing with right now um, that are directly related to that. And and I'm continuing to fuss at him to get his butt out to VA because there's an awful lot of things that could be done for him there. Um, that he needs to take advantage of. And I hope he does that. Yeah. I want hey. to thank you for this interview and thank you for your service. Hey, appreciate it. Thanks so much for the opportunity.